Welcome to the grand opening of the David R. Obie Civic Resource Center. Thank you for celebrating this great day with us, particularly those of you who have traveled far and taken time from your busy lives and work schedules to be here. My name is Eric Giordano, and I am the director of the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service, also known as WIPS. The OB Center will operate under WIPS direction. WIPS is a unit of the UW Colleges and UW Extension, and we're very proud to be located here on the campus of UW Marathon County in Wausau. There are many, many people to thank, and we'll take some time to do that shortly, but it's now my pleasure to introduce Keith Montgomery, Dean and CEO of UW Marathon County. Following his remarks, we'll hear from... <laughs> Following his remarks, we will hear from Marathon County Administrator Brad Carger, who is very instrumental in helping to create the magnificent building we're in today. So we'll proceed to that point. Welcome. Welcome to the University of Wisconsin, Marathon County. I'm Keith Montgomery, campus dean. This is such an exciting day for this campus. It's been many years uh, coming, uh, but this is so exciting for us both in our outreach mission to the community and also in our mission uh, as a liberal arts institution. I think this center fits so well in this community and on our campus. Um, it, I would be remiss if I didn't thank a couple of folks. There's gonna be many thank yous uh, this afternoon. But I'd like, first of all, to recognize the memory of uh, James F. Veninga, former dean at UWMC, whose um, uh, who, who's, who's real vision this whole center uh, was. And I'd also like to thank Brad Carger and the county board. And I'd also like to thank uh, Dave Obi as well. All of these people helped move this uh, vision forward in the past several years. And I would also like to recognize... <clears throat> And I would also like to recognize the Board of WIPS, the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service, who first began also shepherding this uh, project forward. So could any board members here from WIPS please stand and be recognized? Uh, Clay Norbaum is the president. So thank you. And thank you all for being here this afternoon. This is a great honor. My name is Brad Carger. I'm the Marathon County Administrator. And I want to speak first to the people who are here from outside of Marathon County. Welcome to Wausau, our uh, Marathon County seat. Uh, welcome to UWMC campus. And welcome to the Jim Veninga Theater. And, and uh, welcome to, ultimately, the Dave Obey Library. For those of you who are from Marathon County, welcome, and I have a special request for you. When you exit the theater, I'd like you to take a look at the beautiful bank of windows that we have there so you can see outside. <laughs> when, I, when I first started with the uh, Civic Engagement Theater, um, the library was part of the plan. Uh, but it was a part of the plan that everybody said, don't talk about that. Whatever you do, don't talk about that. I don't know what the secret was. Maybe. Dave hadn't promised to make the donation, so maybe that was the reason, but he can be a little temperamental, so he may want to <laughs> so, do that a little quickly. So, uh, but, uh, you know, why would anybody not want a resource like that? But really what I was thinking of was really an archive for documents, and the, the plan that the WIPS board and the people who are active in this are giving us is so much more than this. It's really about a, a process of pro political participation in a democratic society that's both civil and thoughtful and respectful of others. And, and the training that will go on here and will have benefits for the next 20 or 30 years and it'll be as important as the papers and, and maybe more important. And to all the people that Keith already thanked, uh, um, we really, I wanna express the appreciation on behalf of Marathon County government for all that's gone into this. Thank you. As you may have read in your commemorative program, 
The OB Center has a very specific mission and a set of clear goals to accomplish it. We would like to present a short welcome video for the OB Center, which I think explains these quite well. Following the video, we will hear from Chancellor of the UW Colleges and UW Extension, Aaron Brower. I'm worried about being able to find a job after I graduate. I'm worried about the presence of drugs in my school. Everything in politics seems so negative. I don't know if my opinion really matters. The future is going to be experienced by young people. This society is facing a lot of choices on a lot of important issues that will determine the quality of their lives. They owe it to their country to be informed citizens. I'm Dave Obie, and I had the privilege for six years to serve in the Wisconsin State Legislature and for 42 years to represent the 7th Congressional District of Wisconsin in the Congress of the United States. Thank you for your interest in the Dave Obie Civic Resource Center. The Obie Center is a place to learn about democracy and the political process. It's a place to connect and work with people, even if their opinions and beliefs are different. The center offers a variety of important programming, including a civic lecture series, a student leadership program, a scholarship and research space, and much more. I would hope that it would encourage uh, bright and public interested students to get involved personally in politics. People seem to have, think that politics is so hard to get into and that there's so many obstacles. Uh, my own story uh, indicates that's just not true. I want to make a difference. We, we want, want to make, make a difference. difference. You can make a difference. You can make a difference. You can make a difference. We'll see the day come. We'll see the day That was a wonderful video. Um, I'm Aaron Brower, the interim chancellor of UW Colleges and UW Extension, and it really is an honor to um, join you here today to help with the opening of the OB Center, um, and including welcoming many of the honored guests we have here today. In fact, there are so many that I would have used up all my allotted time if I had uh, named them all, but suffice it to say that this is the only time I've had a chance to speak uh, where there's a former ambassador, a former governor or two, several current and former members of Congress, both state and, uh, and federal, mayors and many others who hold or, or have held public service um, positions. And the first thing I want to do then is really celebrate uh, the public service that is represented here today. What I'd like to do is have um, all of you, all of you, who have or have or uh, are holding elected or appointed um, offices to please stand. Um, thank you. It really is a, a pretty overwhelming um, show of support and uh, dedication to, um, to David Obie to, to have this representation here. Where is David? <laughs> <laughs> we, we really do appreciate the show of support for our public outreach mission. Uh, UW Colleges and UW Extension strive to deliver on the Wisconsin idea the idea of bringing the resources of the University of Wisconsin throughout the state and bringing the issues of the people of Wisconsin to the university. Uh, the way I think about it is standing shoulder to shoulder with communities to solve important problems in the world and in the state. The opening of the OB Center uh, expands opportunities to educate students and citizens about the nature of government, the impact of public policy, and the value of civic participation 
the OB Center puts a particular emphasis on encouraging civic engagement among young people. All of us share in the conviction that the youth of today can develop into the leaders we need tomorrow. Just as a young student at UW Marathon County one day became a revered member of Congress. I want to thank that Marathon County alum, Congressman Obi. His archives, and particularly making those archives easily accessible, um, will help develop the informed citizens, scholars, and the next generation of leaders. So please join me in again one more time thanking Congressman Obi for his continued contributions to our state and the nation. We'll now proceed to the ceremonial ribbon cutting. And we've invited a number of UW Marathon County students to join us. We're grateful for them. Ambassadors, student government leaders, multicultural resource uh, center students, and many others. And we also would like the guests on stage to join us in the ribbon cutting. Thank you, students. Did you see the look on Congressman Obi's face when he saw those scissors? <laughs> <laughs> it's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers in the order that they will speak. And uh, you can also follow this along in your program. But we'll first be pleased to hear from Congressman Tom Petri from the Wisconsin 6th Congressional District. He will be followed by Jake Longenhan, a UW Marathon County student and also an elected member of the County Board of Supervisors and a WHIPS intern. Following Jake, we'll hear from Congressman Sean Duffy from Wisconsin's 7th Congressional District. Following Congressman Duffy, we'll hear from Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz from Florida's 23rd Congressional District, followed by Senator Tammy Baldwin from the great state of Wisconsin. Following that, <laughs> And we'll proceed to that point. Well, I'm happy to be here this evening to, to dedicate the Dave Obey Civic Resource Center. And I uh, uh, bring you greetings from another longtime congressman and uh, illustrious public servant from this area who celebrated his 92nd birthday earlier this week, uh, former Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird. We had a nice conversation. He told me a couple stories about Dave. I might share them afterward uh, at dinner. <laughs> but for many reasons, it's fully appropriate that all of us are here today. It's the opening of a center that's dedicated to research, civic engagement, bipartisanship, public service, and it's named after someone who spent over 40 years representing our state in the United States Congress. I find it fitting that the speakers today represent all ends of the political spectrum come from vastly different backgrounds in our great state. I know that we all have no end of stories about Dave, which I am sure will be both entertaining and will help illustrate why this center is, is so aptly named. I had the pleasure of serving with Dave in Congress for over 30 years. By the time I came to Congress in 1979, Dave was already a seasoned legislator, and he had a lot to offer to me as a freshman. He even took me to lunch at the Democratic Club in Washington when I first, first arrived. And in addition to helping me find my way around the Capitol, to working uh, across the aisle to build relationships and get things done 
uh, from the get-go. Dave also demonstrated a fiery passion for the issues that he was fighting for. And incredibly, he's never lost that passion to this day through all the ups and downs that anyone experiences serving in the Congress. Throughout that time, my staff and I have looked to Dave's office for guidance on many issues. And Dave and his staff were always helpful and always accommodating. In fact, about 20 years into my time in Congress, I moved into the office that we currently occupy in the Rayburn Building on Capitol Hill. And none other than Dave Obey was its outgoing occupant, moving to an even bigger office. <laughs> and he left behind a very appropriate Wisconsin welcome for me and for my staff, a bottle of brandy, and it didn't last very long. <laughs> we were very fortunate to have such a diverse delegation as we have in, in Wisconsin. I represent a district where manufacturing and farming are the primary industries. Ron Kine's neighboring district is more suburban and progressive. Jim Sensenbrenner represents the most conservative district in the state, while Gwen Moore and Mark Focan's district duke it out for the most liberal. Paul Ryan's southeast Wisconsin district is the most politically split district in the state. Sean Duffy and Reed Ribble represent the vast northern parts of our state, and every time I think about how long it takes me to travel to the opposite ends of my district, I feel for them a little bit more. <laughs> and you'd be hard pressed to find two senators from one state who were so politically apart and yet so devoted to the common issues that benefit us uh, here in Wisconsin. For a long time, uh, the Wisconsin delegation hel held regular meetings. As the dean of the delegation, Dave would convene these meetings with a keen interest in hel helping one another with issues that weren't necessarily Republican or Democratic, but that were Wisconsin issues. Didn't matter if it involved our specific district. If one of us came to a meeting and asked for another's help, we were there to listen and to help out if we could because it would benefit our state. That's not to say we agreed on everything. We most certainly did not. But disagreeing is part of politics. It's part of being a legislator. There has to be a mutual trust and respect for differing points of view while standing firm for what you believe in and what you know is right. And at the same time, it's equally important to come together and to support issues that impact our state and our constituents. Now, there are a lot of people who say that Congress is more divided and partisan now than ever. But each week, Congress passes dozens of bipartisan bills that make small differences across the country. Over the past year, I worked with Debbie Wasserman Schultz on legislation that passed the House just a few weeks ago without opposition to correct a federal issue with workmen's compensation for longshoremen. For many members of Congress, this wasn't an issue. It wasn't on the front of their minds. But for Debbie's district in Florida and for my constituents at Burger Boat in Manitowoc, it was a real issue that was affecting the cost and availability of their workmen's compensation. By listening closely to our constituents, by finding mutual interest in Congress, the bill is on its way to becoming law, and our constituents will be the better, uh, better for it. If you truly believe in issues worth pursuing, then keep at it. Just ask Ron Kind. He's been pushing for a Civil War uh, hero from Wisconsin to be given the Medal of Honor for his actions at Gettysburg in 1863. And just last week, President Obama announced that he would be presenting the award to the soldier posthumously more than 150 years later. It just goes to show it sometimes takes a little while. The Dave Obey Center will help researchers, students, and future generations of young leaders understand the power of local politics and give insight to the workings of one of Wisconsin's great uh, legislators. Civic engagement is a focus of the David Obey Center. And given that the center is located on the campus of Dave's alma mater, visitors will literally be able to walk in the footsteps of Dave Obey. Who knows? Maybe a future Appropriations Committee chairman will stop in and be inspired, as Dave said he was, while attending college here. 
I've always believed it's important to give back to your community. And with Dave Papers here and accessible to the public, anyone can gain an insight into how Congress works and how it's changed over his 40 years of service. Glad we're all able to be here today to encourage civic engagement and public service. And I wish David the best with this new endeavor, and thank you for having me join with you today. I just wanted to make it clear how loud I clapped when uh, Dean Montgomery was up here. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service. And more importantly, congratulate WIPS, Dave Obey, and all their people that had a hand in creating the Obey Center. Here's just a little background on myself for those of you who don't know me. Uh, my name is Jacob Langenhan. I am 19 years old. I interned at WIPS during the school year, and I was recently elected to the Marathon County Board of Supervisors. I represent the towns of Marathon and Mosinee, which covers about 3,000 people. So that's quite a bit for someone my age to get into. <laughs> Most of them are rural residents, including my family, who are dairy farmers. So every morning I get up at 5, uh, we milk cows. At 6 o'clock I listen to angry phone calls. 7 o'clock I take a shower, and then I'm on my way to school. So <laughs> I became interested in politics uh, over winter break, actually, when my then county board supervisor decided to file for non-candidacy papers. What ended up happening was I kind of threw the idea around in my head and I told some of my friends over winter break when they all came back from college. Uh, when I told them, they all put down the pool sticks and Xbox controllers, sat me down and told me that I should start acting my own age. <laughs> that wasn't the greatest reassurance. So, it's not a norm for people my age to become interested in politics. It took a lot of justifying for me to even put my name on the ballot. I've always, had, I've always been interested in politics and I've spent the better part of this year trying to answer a difficult question. What does it take to get youth involved in politics? I've concluded that the most important thing for youth involvement is the availability of resources so that they can learn about politics. In July of this past year, while I was on the board, I had the opportunity to visit the Kettering Foundation in Dayton, Ohio. And what Kettering wanted to do was ask a similar question, which was, what does politics mean to college students? And there were students from many backgrounds. You had some people from New York, you had some people from Michigan, and you had a lot of people from Wisconsin, which was good. So, what did politics mean to college students? Well, you had to look at their role models that they had. Some of those role models that they had ranged from past teachers, professors, to JFK, to Frank Underwood from House of Cards. So, you know, again, that's my generation. But I was happy because I knew that if you have respectable role models and resources for them to learn, they will become involved in politics. Some of their political idols did range from the right and the left side, which is again a something that we want to stress here at the center. Because even when I was walking through the hallway, somebody asked me that by my haircut I must be a conservative. I told them no because I grow my beard out during the winter. Thank you. <laughs> so whatever resource it may be, a teacher, a politician that they admire, I hope that the Dave Obey Center can be used as that same sort of resource. For me, I've always had my parents to consult for advice. They've told me to be diligent, open-minded, and most of all, fair. And I try and do that whenever I go into work, every, well, every couple weeks when I come into committee meetings. I'm not like the rest of these guys here who spend you know, a lot of time in Washington, which I am thankful for because I have homework. Things need to get done. <laughs> and I'm very happy that Dave Obey was dedicated to getting this center here, especially when I wrote a quote from him while I was doing intern work this past semester. He said in an article, 
I am in politics because I am mad about things, and I hope to God I stay mad, because there is somebody every day getting the shaft who doesn't deserve it because the cards are stacked against them. It's that kind of quote that can get people away from the Xbox controllers and pool sticks, or pool, yeah, pool sticks, and into the realm of politics. Thank you. That was pretty awesome, Jake. You have a bright future in politics. Well done. Yeah. It is great to be here with all of you. What a, what a wonderful turnout uh, for such a bipartisan effort, huh? Who never, whoever knew, Dave, you could get so many Republicans and Democrats coming together, um, showing a little Obi love. So it's good to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, and it's great to be here with all of you. I think uh, the Obi Center will be a great addition to uh, UWMC and to our community. Now listen, it's uh, no secret that, uh, that Congressman Obi and I don't necessarily agree on uh, all of politics and all of policy. But what we do agree on is our passion for America, for democracy, and the importance of engaging our community, but specifically engaging our youth. Dave's had a long career in politics, 42 years. He's worked hard uh, for America and for the 7th District. And I look at, in his retirement, the effort that it took to make sure that this center was built, the kind of dedication and fundraising it took, is a testament to what he believes is important in our civil society, which is a dialogue and a place where people can come together and share ideas and thoughts and debate and do it in a civil way. You know, since, uh, since uh, I was coming of age, things have changed a little bit, and I know since you've been coming of age too, Dave. Um, Growing up, uh, you want the news, you get uh, the three major news networks at night, right? You get morning, maybe the evening and morning newspapers. Maybe uh, you'll listen to the radio. But that was how we got all of our news. But today, things have changed. It's not just those mediums, but it's the 24-hour cable news networks. It's the touch uh, of, your, uh, of your smartphone pulling up uh, a, a news website or opening up your iPad to find out what's going on in the world. And I think that changes uh, how quickly we can interact with each other with information. And uh, doing what uh, Dave and I had an opportunity to do and, and, and Debbie and Gwen uh, in Congress, by the way, they were talking about me being between two liberal lioness bookends there and they're gonna try to rub off on me a bit and I appreciate that, Debbie, thank you. Um, but I, I, I pointed out to Debbie that she was between two conservative bookends as well, so we might rub off on her, but I'm not going to hold my breath. <laughs> um, but look at how we engage with the public. Um, we do town halls. We might see constituents in, in the grocery store, pumping gas, touring a business, and that's when we have a chance to engage in a conversation. But today it's changed. Um, with all uh, the immediacy of news, and the way that we communicate, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, it's immediate uh, from uh, representatives, but also uh, from, our rep uh, from our constituents back to us. And um, I think that's great. It, uh, it, it makes for a better dialogue. But I think one of the problems with that um, is that when you can sit in your living room by yourself and you can put out a mean tweet um, or a mean Facebook post, uh, you'll say things that you might not say to someone in person. And it can actually bring us a little further apart. It can, it can widen the political divide. And I think to have uh, the resource uh, center here, the OB Center, where people can come together uh, off of being online and actually engage uh, in person and talk and recognize that you might have disagreement, but that the person you're talking to, though they might not have the same political persuasion and view that you do, they're good people. They just have a different political view. And I think once we get those kind of relationships built, I think it's easier for us uh, to move to a, a, a more civil political process. And I'm not saying we, we, we listen. I think when we talk about kids, uh, we want to make sure that we meet them where they're at, which is they're online. And that's why I'm going to ask Dave if he'll take a selfie with me later. But um, <laughs> is that OK, Dave? But we also have to go where they're at too, which is on campus, which is right here. And that's why I think uh, in our community and on this campus, uh, uh, the OB Center is gonna go a long way to making sure we continue a civil dialogue about politics, about policy, 
And I think for that, it's going to make our state uh, and our local community a lot better place to work and a more functional uh, place to be governed. So, Dave, uh, I appreciate your hard work. I appreciate all your efforts. Uh, thank you for all you've done and all you're continuing to do uh, for your community. Uh, I'm grateful, and I know everyone here today is grateful as well. So thank you very much, and I look forward to working with you. short people in the room understand. So I'm Debbie Wasserman Schultz, and many of you may be wondering, what is she doing here? I think, actually, that I am probably here because Dave wanted to make sure that you had a preview of who your member of Congress would be when you retire and move to my district in South Florida in about 20 years. <laughs> So as a result, yeah, it's wonderful to be here and to, to see some of my future constituents. Some of you actually might be part-time constituents already, and it is really wonderful to be here with, with my colleagues, Gwen Moore, Sean Duffy, Duffy Tom Petri, uh, Senator Tammy Baldwin, who I had the privilege of serving with in the House of Representatives as well, and of course, Dave Obey. It is really an honor uh, to join you for the grand opening of the David R. Obey Civic Resource Center at the University of Wisconsin. This is a momentous occasion, not only for the people of Wisconsin, but also for the generations of students who will benefit from the educational experience that they will soon embark upon. Now, perhaps some of you thought that when Chairman Obey retired following the 111th Congress after 42 years in office serving the people of the Badger State, that he and Joan would kick back and enjoy retirement in, the, in Southwest Florida, which I know is one of their favorite places to visit family and friends. As a South Floridian, I could certainly understand why they would want to do that. But I could have told you then that that isn't the Obi way. I knew that Dave would still be working hard, continuing his lifelong work, making this state and our nation and a commitment to making our country a better place. And with the opening of the Obi, Obi Civic Resource Center, that journey continues. I first got to know Dave Obi when I was running for federal office in 2004. He was one of the few senior members of Congress who agreed to spend some time with me before I was elected, a gesture that I have never forgotten. And his dry sense of humor was quickly apparent, although I'm sure that he won't soon forgive me for blurting out at the time that I was three years old when he was elected to Congress the first time. <laughs> That is a completely, sadly, a true story. <laughs> I knew early on that Dave felt passionately that our next generation had to be better equipped to understand how public policy impacts the society that we live in, and his strong belief that civic engagement is the key to our future success as a nation. Dave recognizes that with the many challenges that we are facing in the world today, we as policymakers, as community leaders, as citizens, need to think big. And thinking big, is the reputation that Dave Obey had as a legislator and continues to have to this day. And it is one of the reasons that each of us could, that have served with him could pay him what is considered the highest compliment you could pay to a colleague, that he was truly a member's member. That is the best compliment that we could give anyone who we had the privilege of serving with. Now, I'm reminded of a time back in early 2006 when Democrats in the House of Representatives were on the brink of taking the majority back and Dave Obey was going to become the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee. And he asked me to meet with him in his congressional office. I was only in my second term, so that was a, a little bit intimidating to begin with. And when I did, I soon realized that he was actually recruiting me to serve on the committee. And I told him that I was beyond humbled that he would consider me, that, but, but that my colleague in the neighboring district had long desired to serve on the committee. And as a result, I had decided to pursue a seat on a different committee. And what happened next, and I am sure you each have your own story that is similar to this one, was it was classic Dave Obey. He just wouldn't take no for an answer. <laughs> we had, over the course of a year, no less than three separate conversations about it. Eventually, I learned that he just decided to leave me out of it, went directly to Speaker Pelosi, and the next thing I knew, I was a member of the Appropriations Committee. <laughs> and the other member went to the committee that I was pursuing instead of that. So to this day, one of the best compliments that I have ever received was from Dave Obey when he told me that he wanted operational members for the future of the appropriations process. 
and there are appropriation staffers here, current and former, who know exactly what I mean, uh, who, know, who knew that one could bask in the glow of being operational. <laughs> Imagine. Now, I couldn't have been more fortunate that it worked out the way it did because it gave me an opportunity to learn from someone who understood that to succeed in Congress and achieve the greater good, you must have the willingness and the ability to work with those who may not share your ideology, which is a lost art, perhaps. Despite his sometimes rough demeanor, Dave Obey understood that in order to have success, you had to develop meaningful, long-lasting relationships with those who may not always agree with you, as my good friend Tom Petri just said. And that sounds pretty simple, but when push comes to shove, nothing could ring more true. Dave Obey's close relationship with the late Bill Young, another former appropriations chairman, is a shining example. They may have come from different worldviews, but when they disagreed, they did so with civility and respect and an understanding that finding compromise was really the only way to achieve what their constituents sent them to Washington for in the first place. Now, I had the good fortune of developing my own close relationship with Dave Obey, which continues to this day. He took me under his wing, and he helped me understand that the appropriators who truly make a difference are the ones that think outside of the confines of their own congressional district. Sure, bringing home the bacon was an easy way to exert your influence as a member of the congressional committee that controls the purse strings, but it wasn't what great legislators are remembered for, and he tried to really instill that in his members. Dave Obey spent his career on the Appropriations Committee as a fierce defender of middle-class Americans, fighting for the less fortunate, making it possible for more Americans to access quality health care and a good education, and ensuring that American ideals were admired the world over. Those are the goals that Dave Obey strived to achieve as chairman of the Appropriations Committee. It wasn't just about making sure that the roads and bridges in his own district were in good shape. It was about ensuring that the Department of Transportation had the funding needed to provide infrastructure repairs all over the country. Dave Obey understood that being chairman of the Appropriations Committee more, meant more than just focusing on your own backyard. In fact, I remember asking him to join me in a meeting with a group of stakeholders who were in Washington to advocate for additional resources to go toward the restoration of the Florida Everglades, which is America's largest wetland ecosystem. It was a simple request, and he was very nice and accommodated my request, and I appreciated that he was willing to sit down with them and hear them out. But Dave didn't just walk the walk. Of course not. Of course, he had to learn more about the Everglades and the critical impact that it had on our environment. And the next thing I know, within a few months, Dave was down in the swamps of South Florida on an airboat, taking a tour of the Everglades, learning firsthand about why it was so important to dedicate resources for a national treasure that, while physically located in Florida, was important for the entire region and was a unique, one-of-a-kind ecosystem with national environmental significance. He was thinking big. Now, I tell each of these anecdotes not to eulogize David Obey. As you can see, he's alive and well, thank God. <laughs> and he's still throwing pencils at the silly people who don't come prepared for a Dave Obey-style discussion. Although I notice Joan made sure there were no pencils in his pocket today. <laughs> thank you, Joan. <laughs> I tell these stories because they illustrate his legacy as one of our country's best legislators, uh, and that is what led us here to the OB Civic Resource Center. The OB Center will go beyond the classroom, providing the next generation of leaders with a real understanding of how the political process works, or at least how it should work. Young people will be able to follow along in his footsteps, becoming active and knowledgeable participants in our representative democracy. Bob Graham, the former governor and U.S. Senator from my home state of Florida, once said that all Americans need a firm grounding in the democratic traditions of our society, and each generation should understand those traditions in order to preserve and strengthen the nation's democratic institutions, the same institutions that David Obey served so well. And one has only to read Dave's memoir to understand why this new hub of civic engagement would be located at the institution that educated him and that he loves. And to my good friend, thank you for caring not only about the next generation of legislators who would follow you, but about the next generation of Americans who will carry on the traditions of the greatest democracy the world has ever known. May the Obie Center honor its namesake by instilling enough civic pride in its students and researchers that we can avoid some of the strife that we are experiencing today. It has been my honor to join you today. Thank you so much. Dave, what a great gift this is. I am so honored to join you today. It's a gift that is at once tangible and intangible. It's a place, yes, 
It has valuable and important documents and things, yes, but it's also a space that exhorts us to think and do, to listen and persuade, to learn and plan, to respect others, and to be engaged. And it's a gift that comes with a challenge. Similar to the challenge that Dave issued to his high school classmates, it's reprinted in your programs and you should read that challenge. It's a challenge that I've heard Dave Obi rephrase many times to, through the years that I had the honor of working with him. As appropriations chairman, Dave posed this to every lobbyist who visited him. It went something like this. Is there anything that you want me to do for somebody else that is more important than whatever it is you want me to do for you? I remember a small gathering on the chairman's balcony the night that the House passed its own version of the Affordable Care Act. Debbie, I believe you were there. Dave asked us all to think back to when we were 18 years old. I'm sure he was recalling that challenge to his high school classmates. He asked, could any of you have imagined you would be where you are right now? But that question was not about the place, that majestic balcony that overlooked the Washington Mall. That question was about being in a place and a moment where we could play a part in accomplishing a great thing for our country, a part in helping millions of Americans gain a sense of security that was previously unavailable to them. Dave Obey writes in his memoirs about his journey into public life, into civic engagement or difference making, if you will. What he sets out for us were the ingredients when they all came together that made the difference between a kid who was just about to check out and a kid who discovered his voice and power as a difference maker. I think it's fair to say that the chaos of coming up in a family that worked really, really hard but could never get ahead gave Dave a lifelong passion for economic justice. Then there were the teachers, Art Henderson and George Rosenauer, teachers of history and journalism. And if I recall, there was a teacher even before then who talked to an administrator about, uh, out of kicking you out altogether. <laughs> and then there was this campus. The respectful and civil yet passionate debates between two professors, Sam Weiner and Bob Nation, every Friday afternoon for many weeks that taught Dave an approach to complicated, age-old, and nuanced conflicts, an approach that works when people listen and consider. So it's most fitting that we dedicate the Obi Center at a place where today, young people, older students, educators, and document archives coexist and at a place where conversations happen. My own path to public service and civic engagement was not unlike Dave's. My childhood chaos was a little bit different, but it lit a fire in me to fight for health care for all. Teachers also made a difference, recognizing some potential along the way. And as I learned about our state's history, the Wisconsin idea, the La Follette legacy, I developed a conviction I could make a difference. Dave's high school classmates predicted Dave would one day become a senator. In fact, that was his nickname. They called him in the hallways when they saw him. 
And I actually believed I would always be a creature of the people's house. There are many differences between the House and the Senate. One difference is that when members of the House sit in the chamber, they sit on benches. And when members of the Senate sit, they sit in desks, old desks, dating back to the mid-19th century. And just like school kids, senators have been known to sign or carve their names into their desks for posterity. <laughs> I sit at a desk that was previously occupied over the years by three Wisconsin senators. Robert M. LaFollette Sr., Gaylord Nelson, and John Blaine, not in that order. Now, I'm confident that you've heard of both LaFollette and Nelson. So let me just tell you that Blaine was best known for being the senator who authored the constitutional amendment repealing prohibition. Another Wisconsin idea. <laughs> but fighting Bob LaFollette recognized that Wisconsin government and indeed America was being too heavily influenced, in fact, run by the monopolies of that day. And he demanded that the people's voice be heard in our democracy. Gaylord Nelson, when he could not get the needed consideration from his colleagues to take the most basic steps to protect our war, our water, our air, our wilderness areas, he engaged people by the millions in Earth Day activities. Things happen when we engage. Things happen when people engage. We have only our voices, our votes, and the things that we do to leave a better future for Wisconsin, for America, and for the world. And that is what Dave Obey exhorted his colleagues in high school to do, and all of us over the years. Thank you, David Obey, for your gift to make to this place to inspire civic engagement and difference making. And thank you, Dave Obey, for inspiring me. What a terrific group. Thank you all so much. Now we're pleased to have two special video messages First, from former Congressman and Secretary of Defense Mel Laird and former Speaker of the House and Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi. Following the videos, we will hear from former OB Chief of Staff and WIPS Board member Will Stone. Dave, old friend, I'm sorry I can't be with you tonight. You were there as a high school student handing out shopping bags on Main Street for my first campaign. We've had a great relationship all these years. We're gonna miss you in the 7th Congressional District as our congressman. But I know through the OB Center, you will reach out to young people in our area as the Laird Youth Leadership Center does up in Stevens Point at the University of Wisconsin. We're both shooting for the same thing to encourage young people to get interested in government and politics and prepare them for those jobs. Congratulations on this center. I wish that I could be with you. Brilliant, strategic, respected, and tough. If I were talking to Dave Obey right now, as I hope I am, uh, I would say thank you. Thank you for being really a champion for middle-income families in our country, for working class people and all who aspire to the middle class. Uh, to watch him work legislatively was to watch a master at work. He was, he's brilliant, and he could always see three or four steps 
down the road. Uh, so we knew that whatever he was telling us, while we might not understand it at the moment, we would see the wisdom of it very soon. Well, one story that I love to tell about Dave Obie is that he, was, he always spoke his mind. So there was never any uh, the thing about Dave being inscrutable or this. He always spoke his mind. And so you didn't take offense if he was particularly straightforward. And, and it was almost a source of amusement sometimes about how clever he was in speaking his mind. So one day I had my chance to, to manage a bill on the floor. The first bill I managed was the foreign ops bill. This goes back 20 years. Dave Obie had been chairman of that, com that subcommittee for a long time, so he knew the work very well. And so when I went to the floor, I did my um, presentation. We, got, we won all the votes. It all went very well. Uh, and we were in the minority at the time, but nonetheless, we won the votes. And so when I was finished, I looked to him for approval, and he said, you did what you set out to do, but you could have been more diplomatic. <laughs> so I said, oh, this is really my day. I'm taking diplomacy, uh, more um, diplomacy advice from the ever-tactful Dave Obey. <laughs> that same day, Barney Frank told me he didn't like my suit that I was wearing, so I thought, Dave Obey's telling me to be more tactful. <laughs> Barney Frank's advising me on my wardrobe. This is really my day. Two who are not known for their tact or their wardrobe. Dave always found a path, and uh, whether you want to call it uh, adversarial collaboration or whatever, he always managed to see the other person's side, and he wanted our solutions to be sustainable. So to the extent that they could have as much bipartisanship as possible, that was very important. But again, he always was solution-oriented because solutions provide opportunity, and Dave Obie was a man about opportunity for all Americans. Because this center has the name of Dave Obey, it immediately transmits uh, a, a message of values, of brilliance, of clarity, of excellence in terms of uh, uh, being examples to young people to be involved in public service, which he always considered a noble calling. Congratulations, David, on the opening of the Obey Center. I know it will be a blessing to your community and to our country, as you have been. Thank you, David. And David, I'd like to read you greetings from Senator Herb Cole. Dave, while I'm not able to be with you and Joan to celebrate the opening of the Obie Center, I know it will be a truly special day for the 7th District and the entire state of Wisconsin, and most of all, for democracy. After a lifetime of public service, it is fitting to have the legacy live on in an educational setting that will demonstrate and instruct others on the virtues. Those of us privileged to uh, serve with you and got to see you close up with the limitless passion, the energy, the leadership you devoted to your constituents, colleagues, and civil discourse. Throughout the years, it goes without saying, you inspired more than just a few acolytes into public service. So many others now respect the process and countless more appreciate the grit and responsibility of good government. Now the OB Center will carry forth that mantle and borrowing from your present words in 1956 to move forward with hope and confidence into an unborn tomorrow. Congratulations on this rich and greatly deserved recognition, your friend, Herb Cole. Well, good evening. It's wonderful to be here. My name is Christine Bremer Moogley, and I'm a member of the advisory board of WIPS. And Dave, tonight, I'm honored to bring you greetings from the White House. We received a letter from President Barack Obama to celebrate this great day, and I'd like to share it with you. I am pleased to join in celebrating the opening of the David R. Obie Civic Resource Center. In America, history is not only made by presidents and generals. Change often comes when caring, committed individuals take an active role in our democracy, engage in the debates of our times, and help 
shape the future for all of us. Equipping emerging leaders with the knowledge and skills to tackle the challenges of today, institutions like the OB Center cultivate civic, civic engagement that lies at the heart of our system of government by connecting the community with a shared history and preserving the archives of American leaders, centers like this can ignite and sustain a passion to forge an ever brighter tomorrow. Congressman Obi, congratulations on this special occasion. May the center inspire all who walk through its doors and may it instill in future generations the drive to continue the work of perfecting our union. Signed, President Barack Obama. Now, I was lucky enough to travel to Milwaukee on Monday because our president was here. And when he was here, um, we sort of asked him if he would send a, a personal message to Dave. And he chose to do so on the cover of a magazine called Congressional Quarterly. And this is a magazine of, uh, it's called a Quarterly Magazine on Government, Commerce, and Politics. And I'm sure all of you know what it is. It's your trade magazine. And there happened to be a special cover. Some of you might have seen it. And on the cover is Congressman Obi, and it says, intense and in charge. <laughs> and our president signed it to Dave, and he signed, Dave, we miss you, Barack Obama. <laughs> so without further ado, I would like to introduce to you a son of Wausau a student, a scholar, a teacher, an author, a legislator, a leader, an appropriator, someone who has led the country and is a role model for many of us, but most of all, to me, a very dear friend, Dave Opie. Thank you. Thank you. All I can say is it's getting a little deep in here. <laughs> let me thank you all for coming. And let me thank everyone on stage for the lies that they've told this afternoon. <laughs> it's... Um, they're not true, but they're nice to hear anyway. My first two years of college was spent here on this campus. This building didn't exist then, and neither did the main building across the street. In fact, we used to play football uh, on those grounds, and we had the old county normal school, and then uh, the youth building, which we used on occasion, and then another almost a Quonset hut type building, and that was the campus. There were, uh, when I was a sophomore here, there were 260 students, 59 sophomores. I went here, frankly, because it was the only place I could afford to go. I didn't know until I got here that I was lucky because of that, because here you actually had real professors teaching you didn't just have a, a, a graduate assistant as you often did in Madison in the first years. Here I learned of the event that probably changed my life more than any other. I was walking up the stairs uh, at, at, at campus one day and Dr. Henry Arnsbrock, who was then the dean, was coming down the stairs. And he stopped me and he said, weren't those headlines yesterday incredible? And the headlines were about the Russians sending Sputnik up into space. And he said, you know, David, he said, this event is going to change America. It is going to change higher education. He said, you will see the federal government taking, making major changes so that we can learn a lot more about our adversaries than we know right now. He said, it is going to be a watershed event in the history of this country. 
three years later, I was uh, given a three-year full boat uh, fellowship under the National Defense Education Act, which was passed just as Henry Arnsbrock had predicted, which was passed uh, so that, so that uh, we could stimulate uh, student learning about all kinds of areas, uh, the Soviet Union, China, uh, uh, you name it. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get one of those one of those uh, uh, fellowships, and that changed my life. The second event that changed my life also occurred on this campus. It was called Friday Forum. Tammy referred to it. Tammy, the one thing you ought to do if you're in politics, the uh, one thing you ought to learn is never to steal somebody else's speech. <laughs> And I wanted to tell you about this, but she beat me to it. <clears throat> Anyhow, uh, during the 1957 war in the Middle East, we had two brilliant faculty members here. One was Sam Weiner, who taught chemistry, and the other was Bob Najum, who taught English and French. And uh, uh, they were sitting over lunch, debating each other about what was happening in the Middle East. And students, as they heard this, started to gather around, and we found it so interesting that Najem and Weiner agreed that they would continue the discussion every Friday. And for six weeks, they called it Friday Forum. Uh, and what they really were doing was our classes ended at like 1220, and then we didn't have a, a, a class until uh, 410. It was a one-credit choir course. And the problem was that in those days, uh, the drinking age was 18. <laughs> and so what would happen between 1.20 in the afternoon and 4.10, the choir course, <laughs> is that some of us would go down to Zastro's warehouse. He, he peddled beer. And we would play a few hands of poker and, and have a couple of beers, and then we'd come back and ruin choir. So they were looking for more constructive use of that time, <laughs> which is why they set up Friday Forum. And uh, uh, it was listening to that that first taught me about the Middle East and piqued my interest in the Middle East. And I never dreamed that 25 years later I would chair the Foreign Operations Appropriations Subcommittee, which dealt with all funding for foreign aid, including the Middle East. That was our main focus in those days. And that 30 years later, I would be working with the Bush senior administration, um, uh, helping to manage the collapse of the Soviet empire and the conversion of Eastern European countries from uh, centrally directed Marxist economies to uh, uh, more market-oriented uh, democracies. Uh, and I'm convinced that I would, I would not have had any of those opportunities had it not been for what happened here on this campus. I also here gained uh, enough confidence to go on to Madison and to begin to think that I might make something of myself, uh, to my great surprise, given my record in, earlier in high school. But uh, I, I also learned economics here. Uh, Velder Kapitsky was the economics teacher I had at the time. And then when I moved to Madison, uh, we had Selig Perlman, who was a superb scholar, who taught us about the, the history of the struggle of working people to get, a, to get a fair share of the blessings of this economy. And uh, uh, I also uh, learned the necessity to use the tools of government in order to help counter severe and deep recession, something which really came in handy during the debate after the economic collapse uh, of, of, of six years ago. And from people like Ralph Hewitt, Professor Ralph Hewitt and others at Madison, I picked up some of the political skills that later helped me in Congress and in the legislature. So I owe the university a lot. And uh, it didn't cost me much. It cost me $90 a semester. That's what the cost was in those days. Uh, to, it is a bit harder today 
And I appreciate the fact that people like Tom Petri are trying to make it a bit easier through the innovative efforts that Tom is trying to make to think creatively about student loans. And every student ought to be grateful to you for that. And all, Glenn Moberg asked me what I wanted to see happen here with this institute. I said, it's very simple, one thing. Tammy mentioned Arthur Henderson, who was my uh, uh, high school uh, history teacher as a junior. He was the best teacher I ever had, high school or college. And a after I went into the legislature, I went to visit him one day. And he said, David, he said, you fulfilled my dream. He said, every teacher wants to know that they have an impact on somebody else. And he said, I've been hoping for years that at least one person I taught through all of these years, and he taught my mother as well as me. He was around a long time. But uh, he said, uh, we just want, he said, I just want to know that one student that I taught actually wound up going into government and making a difference. He said, and you did it, and you made my day. And that's all that I want for this institution. I want, I want it to inspire at least one student who will think about things and say, hey, I'm up to that. I think I can do that. And if it does that, it will fulfill its purpose. And I hope also that at least one student gets mad enough about things that are wrong in this society and in this economy that they will say, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore and I'm going to get into politics and do something about it. <laughs> and lastly, I would like you to give a round of applause to two people who are not here. One is Jim Veninga, and the other is Jim Lawrence, two superb members of this faculty uh, who are no longer with us. They both died in recent years. But it was their idea. It was their idea for this institute, and all I did was help a little around the edges. And I appreciate the fact very much that, uh, that uh, they thought enough of uh, this institution and thought enough of me to think that my association with it might help uh, either to get it established or to, or, or to keep it going once it's established. So Jim and Jim, to me, it's always the Jim and Jim show here. And uh, <laughs> thanks, everybody. There really are too many people to thank. We certainly would leave people out if we tried. Just know all of you who participated in supporting the establishment of the David R. Ovi Civic Resource Center, we are so grateful. We will be thanking you personally. But at this time, I just want to recognize that the Ovi Center was established through private donations and the lead donor on that was Marshfield Clinic and we are so grateful to Marshfield Clinic for their support. But I would also like to recognize three people without whom this event tonight would not be possible. And those three people I'd like you to stand. Uh, Chris Bremer Moogley and Will Stone. Where are you? Come on out, please. <laughs> yeah. 
they are the co-chairs of the planning for this entire thing, and also Ann Lucas, Ann T. Lucas, who is in the wings somewhere. Ann, would you please come out? Oh, she's already left, but please give her a round of applause for all the work she's done. So thank you all for coming. We are excited about the future opportunities available for young people and even us old people at the David R. O.B. Civic Resource Center. We look forward to seeing you at future events. And in, and in fact, if I can just say one thing, if you can do one thing, it would be to join us. Join us as we further the democratic impetus that we've heard about tonight. Join us as we talk about tough policy issues in a bipartisan and civil fashion. Please come. We need you. Thank you so much.